Uh, I want to thank you guys so much for coming in today um, and talking about the redesign that you guys did of a law help uh, Minnesota. I'm turning it over to you, Dan. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, as Sart introduced, uh, we're going to be talking today about the project that we completed over the past year, rebuilding lawhelpmn.org. And uh, it's a presentation given by my agency, Electric Citizen, as well as a member of the Minnesota Legal Services Coalition. Uh, just a quick introduction for today's presenters. Uh, on the left there, that's myself, Dan Moriarty. I am the CEO and Creative Director at Electric Citizen. I am joined today by Tim Broker, the Technical Director at Electric Citizen. Hello. Uh, there's Tim. And I'm also joined by Jennifer, aka Jenny Singleton, the Program Manager at Minnesota Legal Services. Uh, hi, Jenny. Hi, hey, everyone. Excellent. So now you know about us. Uh, for what we'll be covering today, um, sort of a recap of, of what was already shared, we're going to be talking about some of the biggest components that were part of this project, including a legal resources tool, a legal triage online application, uh, legal service provider tools, multilingual. Uh, we're going to touch on the different phases of the project and, and sort of how each one impacted the work we were doing. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on the user testing that we completed as part of the project. And we'll talk about the relationship uh, between our agency, aka the vendor, and the client, and um, some of the challenges that we faced together and how we, how we overcame them. And lastly, uh, we're going to talk about how we manage the big rocks, which uh, I will sort of explain that concept as we go here. So again, about uh, the agency, Electric Citizen, we are a Minneapolis-based agency. We've been around since 2012. Uh, prior to that, um, most of our staff, including myself and Tim, have been working on the web since the mid to late 90s. So uh, we've been doing this a long time. Uh, we focus, as an agency, we tend to focus on the civic sector, which we define as government, higher ed, nonprofits, arts, science, research, and, and the like. So, uh, so the Law Help uh, project that we're going to talk about is a perfect fit for our mission. We are open source advocates, and particularly uh, with the content management system Drupal. We're a team of uh, highly experienced Drupal experts, and if you're not familiar with Drupal, you can certainly Google it, uh, go to Drupal.org and start to get familiar with a really modern, uh, well-supported uh, and well-used content management system and framework. And lastly, if you want to learn more about us, we're at electriccitizen.com. And now I'll turn it over to Jenny to tell you about her agency. Yeah. So. Um, I work, again, with Legal Services State Support. We're a project of the Minnesota Legal Services Coalition, um, which is just um, seven legal aid organizations in Minnesota um, that have gotten together. And uh, my office's role is to increase coordination amongst all of those organizations. Um, so uh, we're, along with those legal aid organizations, trying to improve access to justice for all Minnesotans. Um, and we do that by increasing coordination and really leveraging technology. So some of the projects um, that we manage that you see up here are lawhelpmn.org, which of course is what we'll be talking about today. Um, and then uh, we also have our Education for Justice program, which creates a lot of the content that you'll see on Law Help. And uh, in addition to those programs, we have um, an online legal advice uh, program called mnlegaladvice.org, uh, and then a website for the uh, legal aid and uh, pro bono attorneys in Minnesota. Um, so for this project, again, we were really focused on our statewide legal information website um, uh, and trying to make sure that that was uh, 
leveraging the resources that we have on the website and making it as easy to navigate that site. Um, and there were three main things that came together in 2017 that I wanted to talk about to provide a bit more background about the project before I turn it back over to Dan and Tim to um, walk through what we actually did during the, the redesign process. Um, so prior to our current website, we still had a statewide legal information uh, website, lawhelpmn.org, same URL, um, and it had a lot of really good information. Um, but again, in 2017, there were three different things um, that really coalesced uh, and, and came together to make us uh, see the need to create a redesigned website and add some additional functionality to that site. Um, so the first was um, some uh, strategic planning that we did through uh, a Justice for All grant through the National Center for State Courts. Um, and we had um, three lead organizations, the Minnesota Legal Services Coalition, um, our state judicial branch, and our state bar association, along with um, a broad swath of other stakeholders come together and think about, as a system, what can we do to um, increase um, access to justice along a continuum of services. So everything from a fact sheet to um, uh, static forms to automated forms uh, to clinics and uh, full representation, um, including also um, places where people can go to get assistance, uh, like self-help uh, court self-help centers and law libraries. Um, so we wanted to uh, create a website that would uh, make it easy for users to find all of those kinds of resources and not be overwhelmed by them and find what resource would be most their particular, how they were situated. Um, so one of the goals from the strategic planning was to create a triage system on the law help site, which we'll talk about later, but just in a very uh, brief nutshell, a triage system that would uh, refine the user's legal issue and then gather some eligibility information and based on that user data, provide self-help information and referrals to legal organizations uh, that would help the user navigate whatever uh, legal situation they were faced with. So in, adjust, in, in addition to that justice for all strategic planning, uh, in 2017 our state court also uh, commissioned a study on uh, the legal aid intake infrastructure in Minnesota. So focusing on civil legal aid um, and uh, tracking um, every uh, call that came in, every contact that all of the legal aid organizations in Minnesota made with clients or potential clients. Um, and one of the many findings from that study was that clients um, often would call organization A saying, I have a legal problem about this. And that organization would say, oh, you really should call organization B. Um, and organization B would say, oh, we also can't help with that. So try calling organization C. Um, so we called that phenomenon bounce. Um, and uh, one of our goals potential clients had to call um, and make it the, the entire system as a whole more coordinated and easier for users to navigate. And to do that, we needed to have up-to-date and really detailed information from all of the organizations providing legal services in Minnesota. Um, so we'll also go into how we um, tackled that problem later on in this pre presentation. But one of the key goals of this, uh, of this project was to uh, create a way that organizations could easily keep really detailed information about their services up to date so that uh, legal aid organizations in Minnesota know what each other are doing, what types of cases they're taking, what eligibility is attached to those cases, and that that information can also flow out to the public so that the public has a place they can go to find what's the best organization for me to call for this particular uh, problem that I have. So then the final um, thing that happened in 2017 was LSC uh, released its statewide website assessment. Um, so every state got an individualized scorecard with information about their statewide legal information website's uh, strengths and weaknesses. Um, so at state support, we sat down with Minnesota's results and looked at what can we do to improve our website and um, capitalize on the strengths that we have to make the site easier to navigate uh, and 
and make it easier for, for people to find the information that they're looking for. Um, let's see. So um, we looked at our, our uh, existing website, which again had great information, um, and, and realized that we really had three primary channels of information. We had uh, a self-help library um, under the Understand Your Legal Issues section, a uh, provider's directory under Find Legal Help, and a link out to an online um, application system where somebody could fill out information and shoot it over electronically uh, to um, the, the right, hopefully, legal organization. But each of these uh, parts of the website was very um, siloed. Um, and if, say, you had an eviction problem, um, you might find a fact sheet about evictions and what your rights are under the Understand Your Legal Issue section. Uh, and then you have to go to a, a separate part of the website to find uh, what legal aid organization might be able to help you. Uh, and then if you wanted to send in an online intake application, um, you would have to actually go to an entirely different website, uh, enter in all of your information, and then send that, uh, send that through to the organization. So our goal with the, uh, with the redesign was to bring all of the great resources that we had on Law Help together uh, as a cohesive whole to make it really easy for users to find all of the information and all of the resources that might be able to help them with their given pro uh, problem. Um, so we did that through um, working on our design, working on some content curation, uh, and then again, um, uh, getting better information about what legal organizations were doing and tying all of that information together with our triage system, uh, which we call the Law Help and then Guide, and guide users through all of the information on the website uh, with an interactive tool to get them both the self-help information and the legal referrals um, that are most appropriate for their particular situation. So again, we've been really pleased with the results. Um, we've I've uh, got screenshots up here of the prior website and the redesigned website. The redesign is on the right. Um, and we've got a really clean design that we love with a really clear call to action with that big start here button. So if people come in via the home page, um, we're hoping that they'll just click that start here button and then that will take them to our triage system where they can uh, find that really curated uh, result uh, for their particular situation. Um, similarly, the self-help library um, has a really clean design. We love the icons um, that Electric Citizen helped us develop um, and uh, help the design that they helped us come up with. Um, and it just makes it a lot easier and less overwhelming to figure out uh, where you need to go uh, within the website. Um, and of course, everything is mobile optimized. So we had a mobile first uh, uh, design approach where uh, the site looks great on a phone. It looks great on, uh, on your desktop. Um, so we've been really pleased with the results, um, and I'm excited to hear uh, Dan and Tim share a little bit more about their side of the development process and how that worked. Um, so with that, I will uh, shoot the presenter back over to you, Dan. All right, um, just wait for this button to show up. There we go. Okay, so should all, you should all be seeing my screen now. Um, a quick note about rocks. Everybody knows what rocks are, of course, but um, for this particular project, as I was reviewing uh, sort of our meeting notes and, and thinking of where to, where to organize this webinar content for you, um, I came across uh, a meeting where we had sort of identified the big rocks for the project. So um, it's not language we always use, but we used it here and I think it's effective. So if you can imagine any site of this scale, and, and um, there's tons of little details to, to keep in mind, lots of little rocks to, to pay attention to, but like uh, a lot of projects of this size, there's a few really large standout items that need our biggest focus and attention, and uh, consequently, we're the biggest deliverables as part of the site. And so what we're going to do today is go through each of the biggest rocks that we identified and worked through for this project and uh, take it from there. So uh, as you can see here, when we went through our initial planning meetings talking about what we needed to deliver for the client, 
we identified this list of biggest rocks or biggest deliverables that we needed to focus in on. So uh, number one was a resource library, all the uh, sort of different content of forms and links and, and such that we're offering to people needing legal help, the triage uh, tool, which we'll get into here shortly, uh, guiding people to legal help, the provider tools, a set of tools for the legal providers in the state of Minnesota to uh, find referrals and to manage their own content online, uh, multilingual, serving the site up in different languages, and then uh, those were four, but then there was also not to not last or least was to refresh the overall design and user experience of the site, uh, make sure we take care of security and privacy, uh, talking about intake process. Once someone has found legal help, how do they get refer or find a source for, for their legal problem? How could they get in touch with the legal provider? Uh, SMS integration, uh, ability to send content from the site via text, and lastly, how to manage user feedback. So those are a whole bunch of things. We're going to focus in on each of those in uh, a section. So, so we're going to start off the rock conversation with rock number one, which was the resource library. And when it comes to any of these uh, deliverables, these rocks that we're talking about, one of the first questions we are asking ourselves as a team and with the client is what's available now? What problems are we trying to solve? So when it came to resource planning, resource library planning, well, the, the very term resource library, I don't know that it's actually used on the site in that way. We ended up phrasing it as a self-help library, but the idea internally was how can we organize these different resources that the current law help site offered into a, a format that was easier for people to digest and find what they needed. So uh, you can see a screenshot of an example of, of what that would have been like before where you would browse by a certain topic in this screenshot example we're looking at permanent resident status and you get a list of a running list on the page of, of different resources um, from things like fact sheets to uh, links to other websites or forms on the left hand column there's there's uh, links to things like booklets or legal forms and so there's a whole bunch of things that are, are fall within this whole resource library planning and so our job was to make this whole process easier for people to quickly scan and find information on a variety of devices um, from mobile to desktop to try and reduce some complexity if we can uh, to come up with a solution for um, people searching for these and, and just overall a visual refresh. And so what that meant, uh, so what we ended up with as uh, Jenny had showed earlier was something like this. So on the left hand side, this is the, a new browse self-help page where um, this also can be accessed below the fold on the home page, a series of categories with uh, new icons and um, some revised terminology simplifying the categories that people might search for resources by. And then on the right hand side, you see the end result of how we're laying out these pages. So we went from, from something like this to this where we're, we're segmenting this out and I'll, I'll touch more on the design part of this as we go. Um, but some of the top goals that uh, uh, we considered when, when redesigning this was the users may be facing emergency and they need to quickly and efficiently find information. Um, they're typically starting with a primary uh, uh, topic and, and within each topic is a primary resource as opposed to choose from a dozen different ones. So in this case, fact sheets became the primary resource that we're going to highlight in each topic. Um, and we wanted to use labels that were easy for users to understand. So one of the things that we did was we, we had to go into the current site and audit all the types of existing resources, identify what each of them do, and then look at ways that we can pare them down or combine categories 
uh, are the terminology that we're using, does it make sense to people? It might make sense to someone with a legal background, but does it make sense to someone who doesn't have that kind of background? Is there any kind of uh, adjustments to the language we're using? And what is the user experience? And so, as you can see in this column of the right, I don't know that this is 100% accurate, but this was an initial attempt at us auditing the existing content, identifying uh, over 100 different fact sheets, there's booklets, there's so over 700 links going to other sites. These are all sort of resources that were available that we're trying to reorganize and make easier for users. So once we've identified these categories, if you will, or, or the types of resources uh, and adjusted the removing some that we didn't need or combining some categories, uh, we go to uh, wireframing the new pages and uh, if you're not familiar with wireframing um, I'll get to that in a moment but uh, basically what we're trying to do is simplify the number of choices right um, so if I were to look at the old site and I wanted to find resources on that home page I might look at each of those highlighted areas where different types of resources were were being called out. So there's a section for fact sheets, there's several links in the footer, there's something in the sidebar. Um, let's make this simpler. So when we wireframe, we're looking at organizing the content on a page, we're defining the priorities for each page, the hierarchy. Uh, we're not looking at the style so much, but we're just looking at how can we organize this in an easier to use format. So as you can see, what we've done here is in the wireframe we identified we're going to make fact sheets the one resource type that is highlighted first right and so as part of simplifying the page let's get rid of the different side columns uh, that uh, and, and just leading people down the page from a series of of content that we've prioritized for them uh, if they fact sheets aren't what they're looking for, they scroll down and there'll be other resources such as forums or links. Um, we'll add a search bar to this page so people can search for particular types of resources, at least that was the concept in this wireframe. Um, another concept was let's reduce some of the visual clutter by making use of accordions. And so if you look under fact sheets, you'll see four results with a, with a button to view more and that's a concept that we uh, did take through design and into production and the idea is to give people a sense okay there's this content for fact sheets there's also other content on the page if you want to see any additional fact sheets you can reveal click and reveal to see them all but to not make people scroll too much to see what else is on the page and you can also see from the side that uh, we're looking at this uh, when we wireframe not only from a desktop but from a mobile standpoint as well so those accordions, those areas where you kind of hide that content, um, how does that work on uh, mobile um, and how, how res responsive is that? Sure. So, uh, well, for mobile, it, it can work uh, the same way. It's just a matter of uh, uh, touching a link to reveal additional options. Um, what we typically do is uh, one of the ways we're thinking in terms of uh, mobile first is is by eliminating some of those sidebar content. Uh, you can see from the big image on the left to the smaller one on the right how content just realigns itself and stacks up from a mobile standpoint. Uh, but but to, the accordions are still triggered uh, for mobile users as well. They just get this, this the same sort of experience. Um, it's also something that we uh, identified as a way to make them accessible. So someone, for example, not using a mouse can tab with their keyboard to these different accordions and, and use their keyboard to expand and collapse them. So we've got two more questions here. Um, first, like what, uh, could you explain a little more like what is a fact sheet or what, what you decided to put into those? Sure, actually I'll let Jenny answer that one. Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so fact sheets were a content type that we had prior to this redesign, and they're basically um, two to five page um, plain language explanations of common legal topics that folks are facing. 
Um, so uh, for, like our most popular one is explaining um, the termination of parental rights process and what that involves and what's your what your rights are relative to that. Um, so we have them both in PDF because our uh, partner legal aid organizations actually hand physical copies out uh, to clients uh, really fre frequently. And then we also have the um, online version of them where they're accessible. Uh, next question um, was, what, what type of user testing have you guys done with um, accordions? We've got somebody from another um, legal service or another org that had had a rough um, experience with that. So, oh, so I I can say that um, uh, later in the presentation I do touch briefly on our user testing that we did, including people looking for content overall on the site. We ran a series of tests for them to do both on mobile and desktop devices, and in our observations in that user testing, which granted isn't uh, coverage of everyone that's using the site. It's just a small segment, but we didn't have an issue with that. And uh, I'd be curious if um, Jenny or, or her team had heard any additional feedback since then about any issues with that. Yeah, we haven't actually had any feedback with people having um, problems with the accordions. Um, so as far as we know, they're, they've been working well for people. Part of the part of the test suite was um, find such and such, and that such and such was buried within an accordion. Um, um I think. Uh, go ahead, Jenny. Go ahead. Jenny. Oh, so the testing would be, um, for example, find information about how to get your renter's tax refund, um, and then people would try to find that fact sheet and then look at the fact sheet. Um, so we weren't asking them to find, I don't think, specific details within the fact sheet itself. Oh, okay. Uh, this is Tim. I'm going to jump in, too. And Jenny, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we also have a, a sorting mechanism here um, that will show the most relevant ones based on any given category. And then as they get less relevant, that's when they sort of disappear into the accordions. I recall you have yeah. something like that working. Yeah, so we have accordions in a couple of different places. So um, we are able to rank each resource. Um, so if replacing your permanent resident card is the most important uh, resource for our fact sheet within a subtopic, then we can um, have that rise to the top. Um, and so anything below the four showing resources um, would be less relevant. Um, I don't recall if any of our user testing had people go into that particular type of accordion, but then within the fact sheets themselves, we also have them designed so that each section of a particular fact sheet is within an accordion. Excellent. Um, one, one other question, just uh, a little bit on the uh, scope of the project and the site here um, for reference. Um, what What is kind of the um, overall, uh, how, how active is the site like annually? And then what is the staffing for updating it for publications, links, that type of stuff? People are trying to compare this to other projects that are out there. Yeah, so um, we, the fact sheets are our primary content type and we have um, attorney review and plain language review of those annually. Uh, we review all the other content on the site um, annually broken up by quarter. So each quarter will take um, a, a third of, or a quarter of the content on the site and make sure that links are working and still relevant and that forms are still good and all that uh, type of stuff. Um, and then in terms of traffic to the site, um, I've actually got a slide at the very end about that. Um, but we're at about like 40 to 45,000 um, users a month, I believe, um, as high as getting closer to 50,000 in some months, um, which is a pretty significant increase from the traffic that we've had um, in prior years. Nice. So about a half million a year is what you're looking at projecting? Yeah, probably a little bit over a half million, but yeah. 
And then what, how much staff time does it take to kind of update, maintain this site? Yeah, we have, um, so we have one staff person who is, uh, manages all of the fact sheets and that updating. So, I mean, that's probably 80% of her time, I would say. Um, and that does not include the attorney review. That's something that our partners do. Um, and then I'd say, you know, it's a little bit complicated because we have a lot more active role now, especially with um, keeping our partner organization's um, referral information up to date. But I'd say it's at least like half to three quarters of another staff person's time to manage the rest of the site. Okay, and all, all of the publication writing is done externally. Um, it's just a manager to to get people together to do that and review it. Excellent. Um, that's all the questions we've currently got. People definitely have a lot of interest in this topic. All right, excellent. So uh, all very good questions. Uh, and uh, one last bit before I move on about the accordions. I think one of the other uh, concepts that we pursue in the use of accordions to avoid people getting confused or not seeing content is to always offer that initial shot of what is included. So as you can see from this wireframe, the idea is that you get a sense of what the content is in this section with the ability to view more as opposed to hiding all the content by default and not giving the user that quick snapshot of what they might find in that section. Um, so moving on then, uh, once we get past the wireframes, we get into actually mocking this up. And what we pursued in this case was uh, uh, a new visual language. We're um, using a new series of family of icons to represent the different types of contents, as you can see from booklets to forums to links. Uh, we're looking at ways to increase legibility by giving plenty of spacing between each element. Uh, we are looking at chunking content, which is sort of key for how a lot of people digest content on the web and particularly on mobile. And what that means here is you can see how the fact sheets is clearly visually separated from the other resources as a user would scroll through the different areas of content, they would get uh, it nice clean separation between the elements, which just helps give that eye pause and, and lets them focus on what they want to find. Uh, and again, with the, in regards to visual language, uh, Jenny demonstrated this earlier, but uh, replacing uh, the approach from before, we now have a page dedicated for self-help. And what that is, is this self-help library is the resource library. And you can see the different terminology that we, or terms that we've settled on for uh, legal categories. And then within each one, people could find the resources that they could use to help them in their individual case. Um, and a family of icons here as well to just give a quick visual reinforcement Again, we're just trying to make this as easy as possible for people to find what they need. Uh, so I love the icons there. And a uh, quick comment was that uh, there was somebody here from Transcend earlier um, who has a great legal um, icon project out there that is free, that is available. Um, we just did a major redesign of the LSN tap website and the visual does so much better than the text. I really like this. Good job. Great job, guys. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I will just add anecdotally that, that you know, coming up with icons for, for every legal topic can be a challenge. Uh, it's a balancing act between making something as easy to digest and, and, and find what you need and being sensitive to sort of the nature of the topic. So, for example, with crime victims, we wanted something that didn't insult or, 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 or bring up any negative feelings then were, were needed, uh, but at the same point we wanted an icon that immediately explained what was the t subject matter. So, so things like that can be tricky, and, and especially in these types sort of topics, but um, I think we managed to do a good job. And with that, we're going to go to rock number two, and I will now turn it over to my partner, Tim, to talk you through the triage. All right. 
and I have to share the screen with him. Ah, so yep, we'll waiting for the... Pardon me for the little break, little stretch break. Okay. All right. So for the next couple, so Dan, you know, obviously focused quite a bit on sort of the, the user experience and how we work through, uh, 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 you know, complex content via design to make it e useful and easy to find. And the next few sections are going to focus a bit more on some of the big uh, technical rocks or technical hurdles that we faced uh, throughout the project and sort of some of the challenges that we faced and how we were able to sort of overcome them and sort of how, how each of these turned out. So uh, Jenny alluded to the triage tool earlier. Um, and again, we don't actually call it that on the site. I believe it's now referred to as the Law Help MN Guide. And it is the um, central sort of call to action on the site. And sort of, as Jenny explained, the impetus behind this was this idea that it was very difficult with uh, so many hundreds or thousands of different resources to guide people um, directly to you know, the resource or the service they need, and they were often um, ending up in the wrong place and getting bounced to another place. And um, so, so sort of the idea here was, um, you know, out of the gate, like how can we fix this? How can we um, guide users to the exact legal help they need? Not sort of a vague idea or a guess, it was how can we, um, you know, present all of these topics um, in a way that works. And so the idea was that we would present sort of a series of questions um, presented as a logic tree. Um, uh, and this also, by the way, underwent uh, uh, human language review to make sure that it was sort of flowed right and that people um, could understand the questions they were answering. And as the user works their way through those questions down the logic tree, they end up um, getting a, a very specific set of recommended uh, resources first. That's sort of the first step is like, hey, okay, here, you know, based on what you just told us, um, here's a, a list of, of resources that's in our library that match what you're after. Um, and then from there, the user is able to say, hey, you know, I'd like to see if I'm eligible um, or qualify for any legal assistance through one of the uh, many dozens of, of providers in the state of Minnesota that might have services uh, particular to my issue. Um, so then they go through a second uh, series of questions that Jenny referenced, including things like, are you a veteran? Are you disabled? Uh, what is your um, monthly or yearly income? And then we do a bunch of uh, uh, math and logic on that of our own uh, at the end to try to, uh, again, try to really target uh, the right resources for the right people. And then lastly, um, you know, with such a complex tool, you know, how can we make it fast and easy? And that was true for both uh, the users of the application itself and the editors um, in terms of how they, whoops, how they might go about managing it. Um, and the reason um, uh, is that there were a number of, of, of big sort of challenges here, starting with the fact that we were working with a set of uh, just over 300 legal topic IDs that mapped um, specific resources to specific legal topics. Um, those legal topics IDs uh, uh, went across 12 high-level legal categories. Those categories match the categories that you saw earlier in the resource library. And within that logic tree, we ended up with over um, 1,000 different possible prompts um, that the users were adding. So it was a real challenge to come up with a way to both present this to users effectively and to create a tool that made it easy for the law help staff to continue to manage this tool over time. Uh, there's also, as you'll see later in one of my slides, uh, there's a concept that we've introduced called jump points. And this idea, um, you know, within these thousands of, of and legal topic IDs, a user may start down a path where they are looking at a housing issue and they get three or four levels deep and suddenly it becomes clear based on one of their responses that maybe what they actually have is a disability issue um, or a discrimination issue. That allows the application right there to shoot the user over to a completely different part of the logic tree to start answering those questions. Um, similar with optional jump points, um, 
the, the, the first example did that automatically. The second one sort of said, hey, you know, based on some of your responses, we think you might actually have a housing issue. Do you want to try from there? And it lets the user sort of jump forward um, to a new point in the logic tree to start answering questions. Um, it also includes domestic abuse warnings. This was a key thing so that if any um, response triggered an abuse warning, um, it, it pops up a window and, and directs the user for more information specific to that. Um, Jenny also mentioned this idea of sort of um, leveraging all of this different data that they had where that used to be very siloed. Um, sort of our goal for this tool was to let's bring in the resources and the services into a single tool that, that allows people to see all of them based on how they answer these questions. And uh, the, the last sort of big challenging part of the, the tool is that at the very end, um, we did a pilot with, I think, two Hennepin County services that allowed to take the next step, which was, hey, I'm going to send my information directly to this uh, provider and, and begin the intake process uh, right here and now. Um, and we're actually now, I think we have a slide later talking about a few additions we're making to that and, and integrating with some other APIs um, here in the state of Minnesota. And lastly, again, how do we just make this a good user experience for both the, the users themselves and the editors? Um, let me just see okay, so the next couple slides are just going to, uh, I'll try to go over these real quickly, but this gives you some idea of the sort of planning that, that we started with. Um, we really started drawing stuff out by hand and uh, trying to identify where the um, data was living, how it was going to be organized, how the flow of this application might work, and uh, whoops, over on the right there, sort of, okay, well, now that they've gone through this uh, logic tree and they've gotten to an endpoint, um, how are we going to actually present the, the resources and the services in a meaningful way to the users? Sorry, I feel like, okay, my slides are jumping a little weirdly. Okay, here's the slide I wanted to show. Um, so what you're looking at here is a uh, just one sheet of a, I believe there are now 15 different sheets in a Google spreadsheet. This is the tool that allows the law help staff to manage this giant um, tree of questions across all 12 topics with all thousand some prompts. And you can see here in this jump column, this is where they are able to just in the spreadsheet itself, identify where these jump points and optional jump points are. They're able to trigger when a domestic abuse warning will pop up based on any given uh, response. And over here in the far left column, you can see these legal topic IDs. Each time you see that, that represents an endpoint, meaning when the user gets to the end of a specific tree, it's going to return this legal topic ID. And based on that, um, we are then able to return services and resources that have been have been tagged with that ID. And so it's a very, um, we think it ended up great in terms of a, you know, a, a very easy but powerful way to manage a very uh, complex tool. A quick question on the analytics related to the tool. Um, can you tell um, how each particular question is performing and what your exit points are from that and whether they exited to a resource or they just gave up? Yeah, so uh, Jenny may have more to say on this, but that was actually a, a phase two part of the project where they quickly identified, like, they, they wanted to know exactly that, like, hey, first of all, how many people are actually getting into this tool? How far do they get? Where are they leaving? Et cetera. And so I think Jenny actually may have a slide about some of that later, but do you want to add anything now, Jenny, in terms of uh, analytics for this tool? Yeah, that's been really important for us, and we just finished a six-month review of our triage tool, um, and we use those analytics to be able to like identify where people are getting confused. Or, like, one of the interesting things is that we saw that the kids, teens, and schools topic, um, people were going there because they had a custody question about their kids, which makes sense if you're not a lawyer. Um, but for us, we want to get them directly into the family law section. So we we're able to, to see uh, like the most common paths that people are taking um, and then use that to make adjustments to the tool to, to better respond to users. Excellent. Very okay. helpful. Uh, I want to keep us moving here because we still have a lot to... Okay. 
Okay, uh, so uh, I think everyone has been happy with the tool, and as Jenny's slide will show later, it is getting uh, uh, pretty close to the highest usage in terms of the, the resources that are at the site. Um, we think it turned out to be a pretty powerful tool that does, in fact, return relevant results. Uh, something I didn't talk on very much is that we also have some very um, unique sorting alg algorithms that we use to sort these resources based on a series of questions that people ask, such as, hey, have you already talked to an attorney? Or, hey, are you willing to um, you know, speak to a mediator? And, and by answering those questions, we're able to push uh, certain results up to the top of the list. Um, that uh, in theory will be uh, more valuable to the user. Um, again, it turned out to be very easy to manage and change in that um, the law help staff is able to update that spreadsheet and then we have a tool on the Drupal side that allows us to import those changes um, and they will then immediately be reflected in this tool. Uh, I should also quickly, I, we, we ended up choosing to build this using React, which is a, a, a front-end based user interface library that allowed us to build this in a very fast way for, the, for users and that we don't have page refreshes and there's a, uh, if you, if you want to go use the tool, just go to Law Help, the Law Help site and click start, but you'll see that you're able to go forwards and backwards and start over and uh, in, in a very good uh, user experience. Um, another phase two uh, part of the project was SMS and email integrations um, so that when a user does get to the end, they have something to take away. They can text or email the list of services or resources that were given to them so that they uh, can then refer back to them later. And lastly, I also mentioned that we, you know, we started with that very early pilot project and we now um, begin to expand that to um, accept two different uh, APIs that allow us to immediately, um, through a post request, send the user's data directly to um, uh, I think it's we're up to down two different APIs where that information then goes immediately into the uh, service provider's uh, case files. Just a couple quick screens here to show you sort of how it works once you start. Um, this the, the screen on your left is some of the qualifying uh, questions about how many people are in your household. We actually have a little algorithm that then calculates the FPG number for each user, which is then um, tied to certain services and resources um, based on that number. Um, and then over on the right, you can sort of see what happens when uh, a user finishes and they, they see the services um, in a nice list. Again, we have some accordions down there on the right, um, or on, the, on the bottom that allow them to just from right from the screen see what it takes to apply, how they contact that person, what their hours are, uh, and when they're happy, again, they can uh, text that information directly to their phones. So unless there are specific questions about triage, I'll move into the next uh, big rock here, which is the provider tools. So. Uh, again, we don't call it provider tools. This ended up being branded as oops, Loon, um, which uh, Jenny, I forget. Can you give me the acronym for Loon? It's uh, legal. Yeah, legal organizations online network. Right, and sort of the idea behind that branding. So uh, let me back up. The the provider tools was this idea to leverage all of the services in Minnesota. Um, themselves to start updating their own data and letting this legal tool know which services they're actually providing at any given moment, um, what their limits are, whether they, they serve uh, people with disabilities or veterans or people who live on an Indian reservation, um, rather than having the, the law help staff have to manage all of that uh, data. And so uh, by branding it as Loon, I think that uh, was sort of one big first step into presenting this as a tool um, directly for providers. Let's see here. I'm not sure what's happening, but my slides won't advance. Let me try this one in here. There we go. So Again, um, each one of these big rocks started with a big planning phase, um, and here it was just like, how can we more effectively connect uh, all of these providers so that they can help each other with referrals and so that they can help us manage all of this data? 
um, and that involved uh, a, a advanced uh, search tool to really allow people with, you know, un unlike the end users who, who really don't have a lot of expertise and maybe this is their first time in the legal arena, uh, these are expert users and uh, therefore we wanted to build a very powerful search that allowed them to very quickly drill down and find other services that they might uh, provide to their users. Um, we also needed to provide a set of tools that allowed each individual uh, service to update their own data. And it included quite a lot of data, included, including when they, uh, when they have clinics, what the schedule is, what the clinics cover, um, their FPG uh, financial requirements, uh, where they are located, their hours, all of the contact data, holiday hours, and so on. Um, and lastly, again, how do we get all of these uh, services who, who to date haven't had to do this to buy into the into the system and to help uh, the Law Help Minnesota team uh, keep all this data updated and fresh and relevant for users. So some of the challenges for this portion of the project, um, it turned out to be quite complex in that we, it wasn't just, you know, services, it was really large organizations who often had multiple locations and each of those locations might provide multiple services at any given time and that sometimes they may go away. So we needed, needed to provide tools that allowed people at each one of those levels to sort of update and self-manage this uh, data and to find it. Um, and of course, because it was a sort of more advanced interface, it was how, you know, how do we build this so it's really quick if someone's sitting at their desk and needs to help someone with a referral to go use this tool and, and find the right service. Uh, again, again, how do we get user buy-in and get people to actually use this tool? And then I just wanted to call out here, I think we'll talk about this a little bit more in the client vendor relations section, but we, um, on our end, uh, felt like we did a little bit, uh, we didn't plan enough for this. We didn't realize going into the project quite how um, critical it would be to the project, but we often have tools that allow users to update data and it's fairly simple, but this really turned out to be uh, a very uh, both important and difficult part of the project. So if we uh, could start over again, I think we would have done quite a bit more upfront planning on this one. But that said, uh, it turned out great. I think uh, Jenny can speak to it a bit when I'm done perhaps, but I think that people are largely uh, very happy with this tool. It, it uh, as you can see on the right, uh, provides a quick way to dive in uh, through all of those uh, thousand some legal topics that we identified earlier search by keyword, uh, service area, and all of the various other metadata that we associate with any given service. Um, providers have the ability to, to turn off a service at any time so that if they are not accepting referrals, um, it won't show up at the end of that law help triage tool. Um, and again, the, the data that lives in this tool also is shared with the triage tool. So it, again, it was another great way to sort of leverage uh, this, this vast amount of data and, and make it useful for more than one audience. Um, and then I think uh, Jenny would agree that it's an ongoing goal for them to just continue to sort of push this and to get uh, more and more of their providers um, active in the system. So here you can see, a, a, there's just a couple of screens here that show you a bit more about how this information is presented after a search. Um, right from this one screen, they're able to pull down um, internal staff notes for any given service, what legal topics they uh, provide, and their contact information and hours and such that allows them to then quickly um, send someone else off to that service. Right, and, uh, and this, again, again design-wise, if you could back up a slide, Tim, um, we're making again, good use of, of sort of chunking out the data on the screen. We, we're using high, highly legible font sizes. We're showing people what we determined was the most critical information to show them at a snapshot without overwhelming them on each entry for each uh, result. So the critical information in a summary is there, which the client controls the length of the summary, and then a series of, of buttons or tabs which you click to reveal additional information as Tim mentioned before such as hours and locations and such and um, by using this this mechanism people can access this, this additional information while staying on the same screen so they don't lose the search results that they just might have spent time um, accumulating as well as uh, some nice visuals to quickly highlight particular terminology that's important, such as the 
large circle indicating uh, green circle and indica indicating a clinic. Uh, it's all designed to, to just again make it easy and quickly scannable. All right, okay. I'm going to move this question here. Um, sure. First, um, what was the specific fonts and font sizes that you used as the default? And then, um, the, I'm assuming those change responsively depending on screen size. Um, I, just off the top of my head, I, uh, that's a good question for font sizes. Usually, we're shooting for 18 to 20 pixel size or 18 to 20 point size for, for body text, which is uh, larger than sort of the browser default, but we, what we find is a, a, a easier to read. Of course, it all looks tiny here on the screenshot, but it, it, it is not in real life. Um, as far as the actual fonts we used, um, we were building off of the, some existing branding that had been done um, by the client on another site. So um, we used a, um, I think they're both free or one is free, uh, a Google font for the body and, and then um, Mon Montserrat, which I, I don't recall if it's open source or if it's, if it's a paid uh, web web font, but uh, those were the, the primary fonts that we used and uh, font sizes. Next one is in uh, Minnesota. Is there a hotline um, and does it use Loon in some way? I'm going to let Jenny we take do not have a, Yeah, we do not have a statewide hotline. Um, different organizations have hotlines that cover like specific topics and or service areas. Uh, but no, we don't have a statewide hotline, but we do, um, our state funder has um, made it a requirement of the state funding that organizations getting that funding use Loon when they're making referrals so that they're using the information in Loon as they're making referrals outside of the organization and also that they keep their information up to date. Uh, so and, that it's information. That providers are indeed updating their own information, or do you need to prompt them and manage them to some degree? What a great question. Um, <laughs> I say it's it's a little bit hit or miss at this point. It's still fairly new in the broad scope of things. So we have some organizations that are just really on top of it, and some organizations have had a harder harder time uh, incorporating this into their workflows. Um, but my office is actually staffing up soon to provide um, more staff support and um, prompting and guidance to, to help make sure that everybody is keeping their information up to date. I, I think what, what you're seeing there is very common from what we've seen from other states, especially when you deal with some of the smaller VLPs that may have a lot of turnover or very um, little staff, that they really need that community manager to help them. Um, uh, a question back on fact sheets really quickly. Um, how many attorneys help review those fact sheets that you send out? Is this like two or three or is this 100 plus? What, what does that group of editors look like? I don't have an exact number. Um, our process is that our fact sheet manager um, will, for example, send the housing fact sheets to our largest legal aid organization to the housing unit and have attorneys just sign up for the, the fact sheets that they're going to review. Um, and if all of those don't get taken, then we'll send it to the next legal aid organization. So I don't have an exact number, but it's definitely more than two or three. Okay. So it's definitely a process that kind of manages the community externally. Exactly, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I'll just okay. add really, really quickly there too for for those of you who are not from Minnesota. Just uh, the uh, the whole loon acronym that is our state bird. So there's a distinct Minnesota reason behind that name. Correct. Okay, I'm going to spin through this one really quickly because I know we're uh, I think we're running over where we had planned to be at this point. But uh, sort of the last big uh, technical rock for us was this idea of of a multilingual site. Um, based on the fact that uh, a, a significant percentage of Law Health's users are either uh, low-income immigrants or people who simply don't speak English. And so the idea was, um, you know, what can we do um, with the site content to make it available to those people in the widest way possible? Um, and that started out with simply defining the langu languages that we used. We ended up with 
with, with four, um, defining which content to translate and, and who will translate it and, and when. Um, some of the key challenges uh, was making this as easy as possible for editors to manage um, and perhaps more importantly to allow them to manage this over time. Um, we, we certainly couldn't hold up launch to wait for every single piece of content on the site to be translated. So the idea was as translations come in, they get added to the site and then magically appear for any given content. And then there were just a few uh, technical hurdles. Um, you know, we, we ended up translating uh, basically the whole interface. So all the menu items that you see and buttons and drop down filters um, all had to be sort of translated in, in custom string files. And then we ran into uh, the, the Hmong language in Minnesota is uh, very popular. I think we still have the highest population of Hmong immigrants in the country, but uh, strangely the uh, Drupal translation system didn't have a culturally appropriate uh, language prefix. So we ended up having to do some custom work for that. Um, well, I just want to add, Tim, really quick, too, that uh, if you can just say a few words just about how Drupal as a content management system makes multilingual work so well. Yep, I was actually going to do that on this slide. So this, okay. you can see um, the, the interface for uh, languages, where here we have our English screen, and a basic, Drupal basically um, has a long history of providing good, you know, it's always been an international project and therefore they've always really worked hard to providing um, uh, translation tools and in particular Drupal 8 and of course 9 and beyond um, have really come a long way in terms of how um, powerful the system is to um, add these translations to any any given node and therefore for, for users of course to then interact with that content. Um, so at the end of that, again, we ended up with a full inter interface translation, meaning it's not just the content, it's the buttons and the help tips and the drop down filters and all of the other things that you might see on the site. Um, full content translations, and I have an asterisk there because as of uh, today, the triage tool we looked at earlier um, has not been translated, and I think that was largely a, a fact of, of what a burden that would be for the law help staff to have to translate thousands of questions four times over, so that may be something for the future. Um, but other than that, uh, uh, the vast majority of the site is available in English, Spanish, Hmong, and Somali. And we did end up with, uh, again, that flexible option where as translation comes in, the law help staff is able to um, add them to the site without holding up other parts of the site. Um, and then down there at the bottom, um, again, this, this uh, presentation will, will be recorded and the slides are there. but. Uh, uh, our developer who worked on this wrote a three-part series um, on how to really do this and do it well in Drupal 8 if you're interested in some of the technical challenges. Um, so with that, Dan, I think we have a little bit less than a half hour, so I'm going to uh, uh, change the presenter back to you and uh, let you decide what to do with that time. Okay, let me catch up to where we were in the slides. And um, as far as time goes, uh, we're actually right on schedule, so I think we're doing well. Um, what we're going to touch on here now is the subject of the other rocks that we had alluded to earlier in the presentation and then really just run through the different phases of the project and, and some insights and lessons that we can share with you. So uh, just to go back to where uh, an earlier slide, we begin the project with multiple rocks. And uh, this uh, shows our list that we began with. And um, like a lot of projects, uh, when you go in, you identify those critical ones. Uh, but sometimes uh, as you get into the more realistic portion of uh, how this is all going to work time-wise and budget-wise, some have to be moved to a future phase or left behind. and so. The ones in blue are the, are the different items that we did address as part of the initial phase. Uh, there were a few items there in black uh, for intake and SMS integration, which are both being addressed in our phase two work with Law Help. So talking through project phases, we alluded to some of these, these elements as uh, sort of interwoven in some of the slides we've already discussed, but to take you through our process uh, in a brief manner. 
Each project, we um, begin with a phase of strategy and analysis and um, what that meant uh, for the Law Help project was defining those project goals and outcomes, including our rocks, uh, how we can measure success, and we'll uh, talk about outcomes for the site in a, in a later slide, and then how can we sort of plan and understand what we need to, to, to make this an effective redesign. And some of those tasks involve content strategy work, and this particular uh, slide I'm, uh, I'm going to just touch on the work we did for sitemaps, uh, that's the site navigation, the competitive analysis, looking at other sites, and a creative brief. All right, so when it comes to sitemap, what we're doing, our, um, you know, one of our overall goals is, is always to simplify and to make this easy for users and increase and improve the user experience. So we were looking at, uh, we audited the previous site, we considered the terminology that was being used, we looked for ways where the number of links could be reduced, where we could rename a section if possible to make it clearer for the end user, uh, and how that affects both our site navigation for mobile users and desktop users, and also um, the specific terms that um, maybe a, a resource library, for example, uh, or might be categorized as, or the different um, results that you found in the Loon tool, how can we use uh, Drupal's taxonomy to, to tag these terms with uh, appropriately so that users can find the results they need. So when we were looking at the original site map, you can't really see all the details in, in this small of a screen, but uh, we took time to understand what the site was doing, where it was sending people, how it was organizing content, and uh, in the screenshots here, you can see uh, in the upper portion, the, the menu structure here is, is somewhat similar in that we, we keep a very short navigation. There's really two primary choices to be had, um, just like in the previous site, although we renamed these and repurposed them. Um, but then the site also had other ways to access information in the sidebar that appeared on every page including things like donate or, or um, legal forms. And then the footer had quite an array of, of navigational items, including multiple ways to access those things that we talked about earlier, of the resource library, like fact sheets or forms and letters. And so what we did is we looked at all this and thought, how can we simplify this so that there isn't a confusing redundancy or uh, complexity to the site? And what we ended up with, uh, as you've seen in earlier screenshots, is a, a new navigation that is really straightforward. There's two primary calls to action menu buttons, the guide and the self-help library. We make it very clear that there's the donate and about us, pare that down. Um, the language adds an additional complexity to any site. So um, at least visually, we separated those choices along the top. And then for the footer as well, we put those secondary items down below as, as before, but we, we greatly simplified what was shown here so as to, to make this easier, again, for the end user. Uh, when it came to competitive analysis, what we like to, or as I call it, comparative analysis, sometimes what, uh, in particular in this case, because um, these aren't necessarily competitors to what Law Help MN is doing, but, but they are colleagues and, and, and uh, similar organizations. So we like to look at what they're doing right, uh, or at least what we think is working well and what is not, and what lessons we can learn from that. So we look at sites like the Illinois uh, site or the Connecticut site or the Michigan site. And, and um, I'm looking at this in terms of how are they organizing their site content, how are they presenting calls to action, and how does this work for what we're trying to do? And we looked at this from a visual standpoint. We looked at the sites from a technical standpoint when it came to things like the triage tool in determining how we we're going to organize and build those for the new law help MN site. Uh, and lastly, at the end of the strategy and analysis phase, we, we present a creative brief 
This is our roadmap for moving forward once we get past the planning phase into design and, and site build, identifying those key problems to solve uh, our minimum viable product, the MVP, what is the minimum thing that we have to deliver above all else. And this is a document we can reference as we move forward into future phases and revise as needed. Um, just real quickly, as you can see with the MVP, at a minimum, the site must offer a triage system, provider portal, multilingual, and resource library. And uh, AKA, these were the big rocks that we covered. So we, we did nail that one and, and get our minimum uh, as well as expand beyond that. Uh, once we've got our strategy and an analysis behind us, uh, which, by the way, included all the technical planning that went into those tools that uh, Tim referred to earlier, we get into the visual redesign uh, and consider how um, we need to approach that. So notes from the RFP was that the design needed to be clear, friendly, bright, and official. Uh, and the official keyword there sort of references, at least for me, and I think the what it was is how can we make this site feel trustworthy? These are people that are needing legal help. They, we want to make sure that they feel confident that this is a resource they can use. And um, the way you can reinforce trust is of course in the content you're offering and your reputation offline. It's also a clean and consistent user interface will certainly add to that level of trust uh, as well as considering how we can make this site optimized for mobile users, people all over the state uh, using accessing this information on different size devices, uh, and also how can we address accessibility to make this uh, reach the broadest possible audience. So as you had saw earlier, we, we wireframe, we, we think about um, fields that we require for each one, how do we prioritize if we're laying out a page for Loon, we need to first orient the user on the page. That's the banner that's first. The links to the side of that message for my account, those are secondary, but we want to make sure they're accessible in a logical location. Uh, so we style these. These are unstyled mockups, but lets us have conversations with the visual on how we're organizing our site content. So just From to let you just know, we're, we're down to about 15 minutes, and we've got about five or six questions in queue. So. Okay, I will speed up a bit. Uh, for wireframes to design direction, so just real quickly, one of the things that we do at Electric Citizen, uh, we don't like to go straight to a full page mock-up assuming we know all the different components and how they're going to exactly lay out across a site, especially a site of, of, of complexity. So what we do instead is take a component-based approach. We come up with a design language that can then be applied once approved to different components of the site, which are then compiled into pages. So what we what you see here is is only a portion of sort of a broader design board that we present to the client and have conversations. And once we've agreed that we have the design direction and the, the right feel for the site, we take that direction and start applying it to mockups. So you can see how the wireframe on the left became a page mockup on the right. There are some similarities between the two, but there are uh, design choices that get made along the way. And uh, to meet accessibility guidelines, we have to, uh, we, what we recommend is uh, using uh, a combination of automated tools and some of the more popular and, and recommended tools that we've used include the WAVE accessibility tool and the AXE accessibility plugin. These are both free tools that you can find online, uh, as well as manual testing. And, and for us, the manual testing means browsing the site using a keyboard, testing the site through speech, uh, uh, text-to-speech tools that are offered uh, for free on the Mac, for example, and uh, running through a series of rules that we, we apply to make sure that the text is legible, that content is chunked properly, that uh, uh, so a quick question on this. So with user yes. testing, um, we really go out there to try to get uh, clients to test. 
when it came, came to accessibility testing, did you have testing done by um, users with disabilities or an organization that employs users with disabilities to do that type of testing? Right, so that's a great question. And the, the answer is no, we did not. Um, that is definitely, if you are able to budget the time and resources for, is the optimal way to test for accessibility. In lieu of that, we rely on our knowledge of accessibility best practices and these online tools that uh, help us to audit the site. So as you can see, uh, just a quick screenshot of how the WAVE accessibility tool runs through the site and gives you results are on the right. The ACTS tool uh, inspects the site for any warnings or violations. And into user testing then, uh, segue to that question, um, how we conduct user testing. We defined a series of tests. We tested the Loon tool, the triage tool, the overall website, and the mobile experience. Um, this is something that we coordinated with the client to, to find uh, subjects for Loon. Uh, it was a matter of finding legal service providers who are willing to volunteer their time to come into the office. Um, where we conducted the usability workshops. Uh, for things like testing triage and the overall website, um, Jenny and the, her law help team uh, advertised to find subject matter, or it's not subject matter, to find subjects that were willing to participate. I believe that they offered a, a small incentive to people that were volunteers. Yeah, we, we worked with some of our partners, so uh, uh, legal aid offices had uh, flyers in the lobby, um, at public libraries had flyers, and then um, at legal clinics also um, did some advertising and offered a $20 Target gift card for each person who would come in and do 20 minutes of user testing. Yeah, and so the results of our user testing, where I would document the results meeting with each subject and, and summarize for the client, we were able to identify adjustments to the user experience that were needed. We're able to tweak the tools and then occasionally identify bugs that we hadn't uncovered yet that needed to be fixed by our developers. Some sample comments, for example, in one of the tests, people were supposed to find something in the city of Burnsville, Minnesota, and the tool had, that we had built was organized to search by county. It, they didn't know what county Burnsville was in, probably because they didn't live there. Uh, so that leads to small tweaks, like we offer a link under the county finder to uh, that links to a, a, another web page where people can easily look up a county for a particular city. Um, we uh, make adjustments to um, once Purple had completed the, the legal triage, it wasn't clear to some where they should proceed, so we adjusted how we presented the final results between finding a lawyer and previewing uh, the self-help resources. Uh, but overall, a lot of the user feedback was positive and uh, it was really beneficial for any project if you're able to reserve time to, to interact with people prior to launch to, to, to make those necessary adjustments. Okay, we're down to about nine minutes here. I'm going to cruise through a few quick questions, and then we'll get back if there's other stuff um, still to cover. Um, first one, what, what was the overall um, budget on this project, and how long did it take from your uh, beginning of scoping to uh, launch user testing? Well, I can say that for, for the length of the project, um, it was a year-long process from the time we, we first met to the time we launched. Um, I don't know as far as Jenny how much we want to share as far as budget goes, but uh, uh, but I know that that was the the length of the project was at least a year. Was this funded through a TIG grant? Yeah, we had. Um multiple funding streams for this. We had a TIG grant for about $150,000. And then we also had money through um, the Justice for All implementation grant and um, money from our um, state judicial branches um, technology fund. So I think um, that, that multiple funding sources, definitely kind of the common strategy here. Did, did that include 
um, your time or was it that plus your time? So the funding was um, primarily went toward vendor costs, um, okay. but we did have some funding for our time. Excellent. Um, so there, there's a comment here, which I'm not, not sure the best way to put it, um, which is um, any, any tips or any ideas on how to better do kind of the interorganizational um, collaboration that it takes to put together all the resources, that type of stuff. Um, and they also mentioned that um, it, it might be worth having a, a separate training kind of talking about that in general, because it does, it hits this project, but it also is much broader. And I, I would definitely suggest um, that as a possible webinar topic for early next year, because it's pretty big. But tips on how do you get all these different stakeholders working together on a project this big for the triage tool stuff and for Loom? Yeah, I think it was really helpful for us um, back before when we were um, still just applying for funding that we had the JFA um, strategic planning was a really good forum to get everybody from like social services workers to you know standard civil legal services organizations and get all those people in one room and on the same page about what our overall goals were. Um, in Minnesota we also have um, a meeting every other month with um, with the civil legal services partners within Minnesota. Um, and then we had a steering committee for pro partners who were directly involved in managing this project. Um, so people who were named on those three grants that we mentioned got together every other week to discuss any like um, bigger decisions that we needed to make on the project. Uh, Tim, you mentioned a guide earlier. I'm not sure exactly which one it's referring to, but which, which guide were you talking about earlier? And do you have a link to that? I've uh, moved you up to be an um, organizer, um, just uh, in case you got a link or a reference that you can share with the audience there. Uh, well, I, th I guess I'm not quite clear on the question, but I think maybe the question is referring to the Law Help MN guide, which is uh, if you just go to lawhelpmn.org and click uh, start here on the homepage, that I believe is the guide I was referring to. Okay. I'll, I'll let the person clarify it. It's been a few minutes okay. since we got that one coming in. Um, okay. Um, in the search top right, there is no box to type in search term. Does the search icon take you um, to a search page where you type in search terms? Um, or does it um, expand out and just become a search box? Somebody's asking about kind of the functionality of that looking at the site which I can pull. Okay. How does click that search via the home page? If you click that search icon, uh, a big, nice, uh, airy blue uh, window sort of drops down that allows you to type in your, your, search, your search terms. Okay, excellent. I think that that cover, um, oh no, she was asking about translation guide. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was, uh, I don't have the link handy, uh, but it was on the slide, I, I believe the third slide of the uh, multilingual uh, portion. And let's see here. Um, it's on our website, electriccitizen.com. So if you go to electriccitizen.com and go into our blog, I believe it's our most recent uh, blog post. Um, and it's a three-part series that sort of walks you through all of the, the challenges and 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 ways to approach multilingual in Drupal. Okay, excellent. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. Yep. Uh, that, that covers all the questions that we've got so far. You've got about four more minutes here. Um, if you've got any additional content or if takeaways that people should really consider in kind of writing a grant, a proposal, that type of thing to do something like this. Dan, I'd like to just jump in and make sure that we have a chance to go through Jenny's last couple slides, which may be helpful in that discussion in terms of just the, the results that they've seen. I agree. So um, we will go right into project results. The site launched uh, at the end of January this year. And uh, here's a series of uh, slides that uh, 
show the some of the results that we got from um, launch until today. I'll turn that over to Jenny. All right. Sorry, let me scroll through here. Um, so we've had uh, a huge increase in usage um, since we launched. Um, and this chart shows just the increase. A lot of that is due to organic search activity, um, where I think that our SEO is just much higher with the new site. So um, Law Help is showing up higher in results. Um, so we've been really thrilled with um, that particular result. Um, we also, as I mentioned earlier, have analytics that show um, both what options people are clicking on when they navigate through that triage through the guide um, and then where people are dropping off. Um, so we've had, and these, are, these numbers are a little bit old, but we do have a significant amount of traffic going through the guide um, and people are generally um, the majority of people are able to get through to the self-help resources. Um, so that first, we call it like phase one of the guide, we do see a little bit of a drop off um, and people going from that page where they get their fact sheets and other self-help information um, into the screens where they enter eligibility information to be able to get referral information. Um, so that's something that we're continuing to tweak with Electric Citizen. Um, and we are able, we have a 10 hour uh, a month budget with Electric Citizen to continue to make um, improvements to the website, which has been hugely um, useful in trying trying out new things and uh, continuing to improve it. Uh, and then my last uh, result slide is just to show that um, the guide has consistently been within the top five um, most visited pages. Um, so we're really happy with that. We still like to drive more traffic. We see that um, most people who enter the site don't enter at the home page. They enter at a content page. Um, so one of the things we're thinking about is how if somebody winds up um, on the rights and responsibilities of unmarried parents on that booklet, um, how can we make sure that they know that there's another tool that they can use to find other related resources that might be able to help them. Um, so overall, we've gotten really good feedback from users. Um, and uh, a lot of, I would say, in terms of um, making sure that your project, uh, you're able to communicate your success and your progress to funders. Um, it's been really useful with Electric Citizen that with um, each phase of the project, they've kind of produced a deliverable, like a, a, a design direction or um, wireframes or different actual documents that we can then um, use internally to review, but also share with funders to show them the progress that we've been making with the project. So two last so, questions here as we're into about our last 30 seconds. One is the analytic tool that you're using. What analytic tool is that? So I'm going to jump in. Analytics. Yep, go ahead, Jenny. Oh, I was just going to say Google Analytics that Electric Citizen has customized a great deal for us. Awesome. Yeah, it, um, it was a challenge to get that, to get some of the analytics into the, uh, into the Law Help Guide, but that's what we're using. So you, so you created a custom kind of dashboard for that? Uh, more um, custom Google dimensions and metrics. Um, okay. I do believe we, we have a dashboard for them, but it was more just like how do we, you know, reliably determine where someone's leaving and, and coming mm -hmm. up with good ways to track some of that stuff. Excellent. Um, and as this is a highly customized Drupal site, if somebody else wanted to kind of replicate this project and do something similar, um, how much of this is uh, transferable to another site or how much would you guys be going back to the drawing board? Boy, that's, that's a tough question to answer. Um, it depends on how closely another site would want to adhere to exactly how a lot of Minnesota is doing it, I think is probably the most accurate answer. Um, you know, it's uh, because uh, so much of the system works together, um, you know, in terms of the resources and the services and the Loon tool all working with the Law Help Guide, it would be very difficult, I think, to take out pieces of that. Um, so I don't know, that's, that's actually a great question, but, but very tough to answer. You know, uh, we did uh, work with, or at least talk with several other groups across the country, I think uh, Colorado, I forget which one, Michigan, Mm -hmm. and looked at ways that we could potentially leverage some of their work and it turned out that it just simply wasn't close enough to the specific goals that Law Help Minnesota had to to really take advantage of, of those tools. 
Okay. Well, um, thank you all so much for putting on this presentation. Um, I, I really like the effort that's going into the community to um, improve the statewide websites. Um, and this was great. Um, any resources that you guys have as panelists, please feel free to email me, email those um, to me that you would like included with the blog post. We should have a recording of this up um, within the next few days. And then we've got over 20 more, or not 20, over 10 more training, trainings throughout now, from now till the end of the year. Um, so please take a look at the upcoming ones, especially the two that we've got on uh, security that are out there and share it with uh, people in your program and come to those future events. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.